Billy Goots met the infamous middleweight champion Jake LaMotta at a dinner party hosted by Sam Finazzo and his mistress in the late 40s. So one Sunday afternoon, Jake LaMotta was in town. Do you remember Jake LaMotta? And he was here to fight at the Olympia on Wednesday. Now there was a good looking young guy from Canada named Mills. Good looking college guy, and he liked to hang around with the mob. Uh, Jake wasn't, and Vicky weren't there yet, but Sam Pearl's there. In comes Jake LaMotta and, and Vicky. And Jake is a miserable bastard, you know. You try to crack a joke or something, you know, forget about it. Uh, she made the fatal mistake of putting down this guy Mills' plate before she put down Jake's plate. Jake went ballistic. <laughs> Screwing him, you son of a bitch. Do you remember the movie Raging Bull? That's just what he was, just a crazy maniac. They tried to um, intimidate me a little bit, right from the get-go. Okay, I don't want any of your off-the-wall crap. I don't want to deal with any silk suit, gold chain schmuck. I, I just want to deal with you. Get the paperwork, tell me how much you want. And then the next time we met, they said 50 grand every time we do the paperwork. I said, you got a deal. So every time I went there, I had 50,000, I gave it to them. I stayed out of trouble, man. I never got caught. My dad, you know, he told me, he said, you don't trust anybody, and he pulled me up to his face, and he said, you don't even trust me. Despite the supposed moratorium on drug sales from the National Mafia Commission, La Cosa Nostra has been at the heart of the world's narcotics trade since the 1930s, and the Detroit family was central to the establishment and implementation of the drug pipelines that helped flood America with high-quality heroin after World War II. The first Detroit mafioso to play a key role in the drug trade was Frankie Three Fingers Coppola. Coppola was a cosmopolitan gangster that worked with various crime families uh, throughout Italy and the United States. Around the 1930s, he settled in Detroit. As it turns out, Coppola's mistress was close friends with the Hoffa family. Uh, Jimmy Hoffa and Coppola became not only friends, but business partners. Coppola provided Hoffa with mob muscle in return, Hoffa would appoint Coppola's lieutenants to important Teamsters positions. Such appointments were important because it gave Detroit's Cosa Nostra family access to a national transportation network, perfect for smuggling contraband across America. By the 1940s, however, the United States deported Coppola, along with other gangsters like Lucky Luciano, to Sicily. From Sicily, Coppola became a key supplier of narcotics. Detroit mafiosi became Cosa Nostra's leading heroin suppliers. For quite some time, Detroit even supplied the New York families. Coppola's primary receivers in Detroit were Papa John Preziola and Rafael Quasarano. Jimmy Quasarino, Jimmy Q. There was a stone. I never said shit. You never know he was in the room. There is speculation by some that elements of American intelligence agencies allowed men like Coppola to import heroin into the U.S. in exchange for their help in fighting the communist movement in post-war Italy. The French connection was composed of French gangsters from the island of Corsica who imported Turkish heroin into the U.S. for distribution by La Cosa Nostra. The Detroit family's Canadian lieutenant, Joe Catalanate, helped control much of this trade, using the family's Teamster connections and distribution network throughout the Midwest and East Coast to move the product. From his Canadian base of operations, Catalanate established a partnership with Dominic Albertini. This was important because Albertini was the official chemist of the French Connection, a heroin ring based in Marseille, France. Together, Catalanate and Albertini established a heroin pipeline extending from Marseille through Montreal down to the Detroit-Windsor border. The feds busted Catalanati for drug trafficking in Cuba. Catalanati later worked as an informant for the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, forerunner of today's DEA. In his own way, cockeyed Joe Catalanati helped bring down the French connection. If the seeds of the Detroit Mafia were sown on the banks of the Detroit River on Belle Isle, those seeds came to fruition further east here in Gross Point Park, specifically on Middlesex Avenue. Houses like here to my left and here to my right, 701 and 702 Middlesex, 
were the homes of Joe Zerilli and Black Bill Toko. Following the lead of Black Bill Toko and Joe Zerilli, several of their lieutenants also moved onto this street and neighboring streets like Devonshire and Balfour, creating kind of a three block radius here that was known by law enforcement and internally within the Detroit Mafia as the quote unquote compound. It is truly a family in, in, the, in the blood sense as well as uh, the traditional uh, definition of a La Cosa Nostra family and that makes it almost impossible to infiltrate. If you weren't there from the time the umbilical cord was cut, you're not going to be accepted beyond an arm's length or further. Uh, Joe's really living across from Black Bill Toco, next to Papa John Priziola, next to Machine Gun Pete Corrado, uh, down the street were the Jackalonis, Big Mike Polizzi, Angelo Manley, they all lived here. It's almost European, like the feudal system. You had uh, the leaders, Joe's really and Black Bill Toco, that almost required their lieutenants and their top men to, to intermarry, marry sisters. Uh, sisters of one lieutenant were married to brothers of other lieutenants. Uh, sons and daughters were married off, uh, arranged marriages and so forth. That a lot of these weddings didn't, you know, didn't take place at, at churches or parlors. They took place in the backyards, these well manicured uh, 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 residences with pools and indoor bathhouses and, and, and secondary residences on the residences. From its inception, the Detroit La Cosa Nostra faction has been more than a criminal family, it is a real family. The Byzantine bonds of blood and marriage making it impenetrable by law enforcement and almost immune from internal conflict. Throughout the early 1950s, Tony Giacalone and his brother Vito were the wonder kids of crime in the Motor City. By his mid-twenties, Tony Giacalone's reputation on the street had reached such heights that he was hand-picked by Don Joe Zerilli and his brother-in-law and top capo, Pete Corrado, to be their own personal protege. Tony Giacalone became like a surrogate son to Don Joe Zerilli. He was the Don's bodyguard and personal driver for a good 10 years before he was rewarded with his own crew and became a captain. In 1957, the small upstate New York town of Appalachian was the site of a massive gathering of most of the Mafia's top dimes from all across the country. The New York State Police raided the meeting, and men such as Carlo Gambino were arrested. Rumor has it that Detroit Don Joe Zarelli was there and narrowly avoided capture with the help of his driver, Tony Giacalone, as they dodged police by running through the woods to a waiting Cadillac. Tony Jack solidified his position in the future mob hierarchy by successfully aiding Joe Zerilli in escaping the raid at Appalachian in 1957. As a result of helping Zerilli escape and as reward for the duty, Jack Loney has given his own crew of soldiers to run. A mere six years later, Jack Loney becomes the face of the Detroit Mafia on the streets and is named the syndicate's street boss, overseeing day-to-day -day affairs and reporting directly to the mob's administration. In addition to becoming street boss, Tony Jack, as he was known in the streets, was also placed in charge of the city's numbers and gambling rackets when machine gun Pete Corrado died. Before he could solidify his power, Jack Aloni had to deal with the hostilities of a group of old timers led by Santo Perón. And in 1964, these tensions boiled over into a brief but violent shooting war on the streets that Tony Giacalone put an abrupt end to when Santo Perón's car was blown up and his leg was blown off by a bomb at the Aladdin Dry Cleaners on Gratiot Avenue on the city's east side. We're standing here in front of Tiger Stadium at the corner of Michigan and Trumbull. For a big chunk of the 20th century, both the Detroit Tigers and the Detroit Lions played here. Throughout the 1960s, two major scandals hit the city involving professional sports athletes and the local Detroit Mafia. The last pitcher to win 30 games in a season, a feat that will probably never happen again, Detroit Tiger Denny McLean was suspended by Major League Baseball in 1970 for involvement in bookmaking. The magazine Sports Illustrated will report in this week's issue that Denny McLean, star pitcher of the Detroit Tigers, in 1967 was a partner in a sports bookmaking operation that had mafia connections. Sports Illustrated says McLean was put under pressure to help make good a $46,000 horse race bet the book lost late in the 1967 baseball season. The magazine notes that McLean pitched poorly shortly after that. McLean could not be reached for comment about the Sports Illustrated story. Both the Justice Department and Baseball Commissioner Bowie Kuhn had no comment. 
McLean later served prison sentences for drug trafficking and embezzlement. Scandal rocked the Detroit Lions in 1963 when Alex Karras, after being spotted on a Cleveland road trip with Tony Jackaloni and other Mafia members, was investigated by the NFL for gambling and forced to sit out an entire season. And uh, they asked me if I wanted to book football out of my house. Sports gambling had become one of the family's chief sources of income. Fascioni was recruited to take anonymous bets over the phone from wealthy bettors. Well, the accountant that I was working with, he set up a sheet, all code. So when these people called me up, I didn't know who they were. They just said, H2, and they told me the team. I went down, I put the amount of money, that was it. Nothing under 5000 Billy Goots and his childhood friend Lester Felton, who he was by now managing, were ordered by Sam Finazzo to throw a major fight. And Felton's loss at Madison Square Garden almost sent them all to prison, as well as derailing Felton's career. Only time that history of the Madison Square Garden fighter got disqualified. People were throwing shit at us, hitting us hidden. By the time we get to the dressing room and everything else, big inquiry. They told us, consider yourself under house arrest. And to fix an athletic event in the state of New York was like 20 years. Billy Goots was later called in by Frank Carbo to meet with Jim Norris, president of IBC Boxing, after the fiasco in the ring. Him and Frank Carbo teamed up, Jimmy. And he had all the money in the world. He didn't need it. But he liked playing gangster, I guess, you know. Jimmy Young was sitting on the bench, uh, a couple of other fighters, you know, prominent fighters, waiting to see Mr. Norris. So I finally buzzed in, I go in, he's sitting there behind this great big beautiful mahogany desk. Over in the corner was Frank Carbo. Carbo looked at me. Carbo, who had been a member of the infamous Murder, Inc. in New York, was later sentenced to 25 years in prison for extorting a boxer. And he reached open the drawer and he took out this big brown manila envelope. He threw it at me. The envelope hit my chest, fell on the floor. I picked it up. He said, get your nigger, get out of New York, and don't come back. Jim Norris eventually saw his IBC boxing committee dissolved by the government. But when he died in 1966, he was one of the richest men in the United States. This is Greektown, downtown Detroit. During the majority of the 20th century, all the way up into the early 1980s, this drag, this main drag of Greektown on Monroe Street, was the most concentrated area hotbed of mafia activity in the entire downtown area. In the 1950s, the Vitali brothers took over as captains of Greektown and were kind of known as the ambassadors of this entire area. Paul Vitali was the older brother, Peter Bozzi Vitali was his younger brother, and the Vitalis ran the Grecian Gardens restaurant for the Corrado brothers. Now, in the early 1960s, 60s, the Detroit State or the Michigan State Police raided the Grecian Gardens, uh, led by Vincent Persante, who was really the Detroit mob's number one nemesis in law enforcement. Persante was dogged in his pursuit against the Detroit Mafia. Now, this raid uncovered several black books, ledgers that the Vitalis and the Corrados had kept uh, of people that were gambling with them, debts, things that they owed, people that owed them, and so forth. Political figures, judges, lawyers police officers. It was a pretty big scandal, and it's centered here in Greektown. Illegal lotteries, known as the Numbers, were run by black gangsters in Detroit until the 1940s, when legal problems forced most of them to leave town. The mob quickly moved in, and Pete Corrado established a smooth-running operation that took in millions from a mostly black clientele in central Detroit. Just as Tony Jack took over this operation, a massive raid by the IRS, along with state and local police, hit the Numbers Bank headquarters. The Gotham Hotel on John R Street, near what is now Detroit's Orchestra Hall, was one of the premier black hotels in the country throughout the 1940s and 50s. But by 1962, it had become the central management point for the city's numbers racket. When 112 law enforcement officials raided the hotel on November 9, 1962, they found 160,000 betting slips, 33 adding machines, and accounting ledgers that showed annual receipts of over $21 million, roughly $150 million in today's money. 
After the Gotham Hotel raid, boss Joe Zarilli ordered the family out of day-to-day -day operations, and Black Numbers operators took over, paying a fee to the mob for the right to operate.